so happy that this is the final uh, uh, artist talk of 2014. And uh, first of all, uh, the final yeah. of 2014, because in 2015 uh, we will go on uh, with, with possibly with Domenico Mangano speaking here in the audience. Uh, and, uh, and uh, so, first and foremost, uh, thank you Rita Vitturelli from the Italian Cultura for hosting the event. And uh, for those of you that uh, have still not been to this kind of events, uh, my name is Massimo Benvenu, I am a program coordinator for the IFA Business Netherlands. Sitting next to me is Lorenzo Benedetti, who is the curator for the Apple Arts Center uh, also in Amsterdam. And uh, on the far right of the table, we have uh, the pleasure of uh, having as a guest, as the final guest of 2014, Radim Martino. Thank you, Ra, for coming to Amsterdam for this. Thank uh, and thanks to Marco Mendes. Uh, before we start with, uh, with tonight's art artist talk, uh, I would like, of course, first to thank Marco Member, who is the organizer and creator of this series. Uh, I have to say that during this year we had uh, the best thing about this kind of events is that every time we did something different. Because every artist or every collective of artists that we had as guests, they all ask for a different approach. Just like the art is many times similar, but in other times it's different by approach. And uh, some artists say, I don't want to speak. Some artists like Giovanni Tarita, who's also here in the audience, say, I will speak and uh, present my work. And then me and Lorenzo just look at each other most of the evening. And uh, other times it was a straightforward film screening, like with Zimba Frey. And, uh, and tonight, Ra asked us, not to talk that much, <laughs> she said. And uh, so, uh, what we what we are uh, going to do is uh, first, maybe Lorenzo will say a few things about Ra and her work, and then maybe we see a clip or a, a work from Ra, and the conversation will start from there. Uh, Lorenzo, I know that you know Ra. Yes, it's a, it's a big pleasure to have Ra. Uh, uh, we did some, some project together and one of the most interesting was in Busan, it was a biennial in 2006. That, uh, Busan is a city in Korea and uh, was organizing one, one bi biennial and I was curating the separate with other people and uh, Ra was one of the artists. And uh, there we, we show one of, of, of your works. And the, 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 um, well, I think the work of rice is, 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 is very adapted also because there are a lot of like little bit in this series of thoughts but especially with the rice there are a lot of links and relations with the, um, the, uh, with the cinema but also the technique of making videos and how it works and how is the scene and the set of the movies they are linked together with a kind of narrative which uh, each time there is kind of showing something behind and it's um, from, from different situations to also the, uh, uh, the, the project uh, that was uh, you show in Bovisa was the first time that, uh, the, uh, in Morocco and uh, Alger, this uh, uh, beautiful uh, idea of, of time in cinema, how actually there's a kind of time that is shown by the kind of archaeological settings of the scenes of several movies that were uh, were uh, shot in, in the desert of, uh, of uh, Algeria and Morocco, and uh, where there are this, uh, this uh, kind of uh, um, uh, rest of buildings that with the time they they, 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 they can accelerate this idea of, 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 of archaeology. And I have to think also about uh, looking at that, that, uh, that work, I was thinking uh, um, when they were making one of the colossal in, uh, in Los Angeles, they um, they find uh, sets of the beginning of the 20th century of uh, um, 
Uh, in the 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 the sand there was still a lot of huge parts that it was actually more expensive to take it away than the, to build it almost so they, they were some rest. So it's it's interesting this idea of time and and and, and, and uh, infrastructure of, of the cinema and, and, the, and how the video the art can show all these parts. Yes but the the other thing that didn't the first time I heard about the art was the work that she made uh, about the art walls. I saw it was a series of, of pictures taken on the sets of uh, Star Wars. Star Wars is um, part of everybody's collective memory and all of a sudden we had uh, uh, physical memories of that memory which is a fictional memory, not an actual real culture. But the fact that now all of a sudden we remember them and these sets were uh, sort of put in within an art context. All of a sudden we said, oh yes, of course. Uh, I, 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 I had the same kind of recognition of seeing the relics of a former civilization. With just the fact that this civilization is a fictional one. And, uh, and this was a series of, of pictures. And then when I started seeing uh, her work as a video artist, I, I thought to myself, well, it's pretty much the same uh, idea because uh, she also works, she also plays with the concept of fiction and reality in video. Of course, a video is uh, something that is already fiction, so we have a fiction of a fiction of a fiction, sort of a <laughs> recognized of fiction itself. And uh, to quote an interview that Ra did uh, at, uh, six, seven years ago that she doesn't remember, you know. Uh, there's fiction and reality, but every fiction is also fiction. Yes. You said that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so every fiction is everything is fiction, everything is Never reality. Never mind, again. <laughs> <laughs> everything is reality, but everything is also fiction. Uh, so it's very cinematic, because obviously cinema is not reality. So when you say my work is fiction, then you immediately fall into the realm of cinema. You also fall into the realm of art, because is art real? We could go on discussing the whole night or more about the concept, is art real, is art not real? Art is, if nothing else, a projection, a representation, a mise-en-scene, a, a construction, a, a, physic, a, a physical reproduction of, of a thought. Yeah, but it's uh, interesting that, if, that there's always this concept of the, of the frame, and uh, what is happening uh, with the art inside this idea of looking at cinema is that very often the art likes also to show the technical aspects, the trick, the, what is behind the set. This is uh, happening almost only in the art because it's, uh, the, the, the art is a kind of thing that you have to, to show the space that is behind the fiction. Yeah. And so all the uh, technical thing, the people are shooting we have, no, your work mm -hmm. and the other artists there, they really, at the end they show you that it's fake. Mm -hmm. And that is, the cinema will never really allow you to, to do it because you have to still play the game until the end. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, yes. it's, I don't know, maybe you know because you are well, well I, I could quote uh, some Welsh fake for, fa uh, for fake yes. or Jean-Luc Godard, or half of his filmography, or if not this whole filmography. But uh, uh, the other thing that is added on this on video art work of art is uh, the genres. She, she, she takes the assumption that the audience makes when she sees a film. And, and the audience might expect and they have expectations of if I see a, a documentary then I expect to be informed about this setting of this story of this drama. If I see um, uh, a drama I expect to see that. If I, if I see uh, some people singing I expect to see to hear the song, not to hear them rehearsing the song. So it's always a, a game that uh, she has, she starts with the audience on what the audience expects to see and what she doesn't let them see or what she shows them stuff that you are not supposed to see or something else or she simply plays with the expectation and once again we go back to the concept of fiction and reality 
because just like we make the assumption, yes, we all know Star Wars and it is our past, or maybe it is our future. And then you see a film and you think I'm seeing a film, and then no, I'm not seeing a film, I'm seeing something else. You know, it, it, it's a creation of different layers based on the collective memory, the expectations, the, what we feel, what the audience feels. It's also about the context, I mean, there are concepts where you can play about this. We are embarrassing her. No, no, no. No, it's actually because it's like when you're doing these films in which you're dead, like uh, you're in paradise and you see all the people that love you and talk about you. Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> like I'm not actually, I'm here. But, <laughs> no, but it's nice because it's what I asked you to do. <laughs> so we said, we said actually the opposite of you. Yes. But you see, we are also nice. playing with your expectation exactly. because maybe we are all dead and we are not <laughs> Maybe we are all we're alive sure. and exactly. we are not sure if we are dead or alive. Or if this is fiction, reality. Maybe this is fiction, maybe this is fiction. Maybe this is fiction. I think we are alive because it's better. If Peter wasn't here, we were talking Italian. <laughs> but maybe because maybe we have taken the blue peel or the red peel, and, you know, the cap and the video peel. And, <laughs> And maybe we've taken the wrong film and we enter a different kind of reality or a different kind of fiction. But I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Lorraine. No, uh, it won't happen. Okay, but maybe we can, uh, no, no, I was just with, thinking with the... while you were talking about all this that because I've recently done this short uh, sort of documentary, mm -hmm. which was the first time for me to start from uh, a real yeah. place. Yeah. Uh, and then literally I thought I'm going to do a documentary. That's why. Right. Yeah. Also in, in Morocco, was also the uh, yeah, but for me, that wasn't meant to be because, you know, I took two kids and had them act. So, yeah, it was about a real place, but I wasn't, my plan wasn't to describe a place. Well, with uh, this um, place in Rome where I did this documentary, my initial idea was to actually describe, as, you know, I said to myself, I'm going to try this medium, literally. And, and then I realized I could, just couldn't just stick to the reality of it because it, it, it's just not my... In my chords, you know, and so I started changing it and changing it, and then it became a stage where things very surreal happened. And I realized for me that was uh, more real than just showing how the place is. So it's uh, it's also in that case was uh, really that thing. So, and are you blind that maybe we will get to see a clip? <laughs> or, also, because maybe. Not everyone in the audience is nice. familiar with the work. Mass, mass, mass is a magazine or statuto. Well, Roma, piazza Vittorio, 980 metri di portici, 280 colonne, 6 edicole, 3 chioschetti dei fiori, chioschetto da Beppe Storico, 14 palme, 4 cedri del Libano, 12 pini marittimi, 20 platani, galleria grilli mobili, 2 camion del cinema, osteria Angelino, barbone che dorme, bar Crystal. Non solo cuoio, ingresso metro, OVS, distributore Durex, bici bianchi bianca, galleria Venturini, extra banca, negozio di scarpe, agenzia di viaggi Europa 2000, pizzeria Yok, negozio cinese con pantaloni flu, negozio cinese Zin Zong Wu Jeans, negozio cinese quasi vuoto, negozio cinese completamente vuoto, negozio cinese. Negozio cinese Omen che vende solo calze e fuso, fermata del tram, negozio Zin Chen, caffè del portico, Augusto Fashion, negozio cinese Duodeli, barbone che fuma steso, stracci vari, distributore preservativi contro, negozio cinese origine SRL, chiesa con Madonna, fermata metropolitana, bar davanti alla metro, negozio Anticoli, Gattara, gruppo di teenagers che entrano al parco, ragazzi che giocano a basket, Due ragazze che ballano, coppia che si bacia, amici sulle scale, signore sulla panchina che si risveglia, la porta magica, cartomante, mas.
tunnel 74 noi veniamo da, dalla strada in pratica perché mio padre è un vecchio come si dice volgarmente bancarellaro e noi facevamo le cinque province mio padre venne a Roma nel 65 io avevo cinque anni poi ho avuto fortuna ma non fortuna perché mio padre aveva un carisma meraviglioso mio padre riusciva a farsi dare la merce senza soldi solo per il suo modo di fare perché era una persona che bastava una stretta di mano non servivano firme diceva tu mi porti questa merce io la vendo e ti do la mia parola d'onore che verrai pagato e riusciva a creare un impero veramente un impero mi ricordo passavamo davanti a questa via questo magazzino era chiuso mio padre, un napoletano di provincia a mezzo analfabeta passiamo qua davanti me lo ricordo come se fosse adesso mi viene la pelle d'oca mi disse piccere quanto è bello questo palazzo eh, papà, è bello sì ma chissà di chi è io sa che faccio, non voglio proprio vedere di chi è niente di mim e niente per dim vuol dire niente abbiamo e niente abbiamo da perdere quindi tentare nella vita chi non, chi non tenta non si troverà mai nulla papà ma tu sei pazzo ma che dici mi devi pedi ma e adesso ci, ci troviamo nel 2013 che sono circa 40 anni che siamo qua dentro con un tipo di politica commerciale guadagnare poco ma vendere tanto quindi se una cosa costa un euro venderla 1,10 però invece di venderne 100 ne vendi 1.000 mezzi al giorno che alla fine il guadagno è lo stesso e noi siamo stati sempre il magazzino del popolo dei poveri della gente che prende 500 euro al mese del pensionato che non si può comprare le, le cose firmate de, de, de la, della casalinga che purtroppo ha uno stipendio solo che entra in casa vengono da massa che con 50 euro sarebbe tutta la famiglia
事啊？你可以听。Lo sai chi sei? So the, the, no, the, um, the thing is also to play about this concept that it's uh, closed, that it was going to, to be closed, this, uh, this place, this shop, and then there's this moment that she's completely feeling this, she cannot escape anymore. So this uh, is, a, is a place that's very uh, projected in the past, no? in a certain way, no? the, the, the history, the, the kind of age of this shop is very old, and yes, at the moment is also this kind of fiction that's coming from, from the identity of the, of the place. And this, person cannot escape anymore kind of dimension which is uh, uh, which was also this, this thing that you know that since a long time it's, it's going to be close and because it's always there like a kind of zombie <laughs> kind of thing. And then she this this kind of moment from the documentary and this story about this uh, kind of special story also this uh, this place. That is this person which is then also captured by by uh, the entity of the of, of the shop. So it's, uh, The owner, yeah. The owner. Yeah, although it's an actress that really acts the voice because the owner what wouldn't be filmed. So it's interesting that what is the first source of many documentaries, which is the actual, you know, sort of the protagonist of the story, the daughter of the founder of this uh, shop, let's call it shop, is is actually. An actor, right? So it is a it is a mix of fiction and reality already. And then we step into this second part, which is the remake, because here you are remaking a, a, a famous episode of uh, Twilight Zone, right? Yeah. With, yeah. with Sandra Jacarelli. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so my first question is. When did you think about Twilight Zone? Well, it was actually quite early on because I was starting to film without a plan because we literally thought it was closing in a month, so we just started filming. And then I realized that just observing wasn't enough. And the more time I was in there, it was so absurd the place. You can't really see it just by seeing it. Once you're inside, first of all, after a few hours, you feel 20 years older because of the dust and these mirrors. I don't know what it is, but you feel different. So you get in a really bad mood and you start going into a diff different dimension. So we kept saying that. And then I thought these, uh, the mannequins, they um, call them mannequins, yeah. uh, they are amazing. They're really a big thing for us because they're sort of polished mannequins from, I don't know, the 60s or 80s, and they have this uh, nice way of being ruined. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, and so it reminded me of uh, that episode of the Twilight Zone where the mannequin wakes up in the night and is, uh, thinks he's a human. And since they have a floor that is um, empty, as in the episode. So, and it's really funny because they have these amazing uh, lamp, uh, lamp things, which were from the time where there were really luxury shops. Uh, but they're still there and some are half hanging almost from the floor. So there is something that reminded me as well of, the, of that era. But in an odd way, it was then sort of falling apart. But did you ever think about creating your own 
sort of uh, flashback because let's say these these mannequins are also a relic of time, mm -hmm. just like the Star Wars relics, so something that was there 40 years ago. So you could have come up with your own flashback to the past. But like instead, you something personal or yeah, a story instead, that I invented? Yeah, no, because it's interesting that instead you went to the uh, again to the collective memory of recreating in mass something that belongs to fictional culture. Yeah, Which but that's because we, we did grow up, that, that is collective memory, but it's also our personal memory, which yeah. is a yeah. topic that is very interesting for me. But that is like, for me, Twilight Zone, it is a personal memory, mm -hmm. and I do, I do think of that when I'm in Mass or in yeah. other so places. When, when was the first time that you went to Mass in your life? <laughs> personal question, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't but know. This would be a moment where. <laughs> <it's very laughs> are, you, are you currently wearing anything? No, I, I have to say, I went uh, for time because I was working really in, uh, at the time I was working in Zerinz, I was at Piazza Vittorio 144, which was at the corner of Mass. So I was really, you know, I know very well the, 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 the square and the, all, all the place that uh, you were uh, actually showing this kind of uh, uh, counting, description of uh, every element of this very strange square, that since ever was completely uh, decontextualized because it was uh, made in the late 19th century as a kind of very bourgeois place and then very, very soon became a kind of decay of this area that are close to the station. So it was losing this kind of really uh, important grandeur. grandeur and became a kind of patchwork of a lot of different cultures. That's actually one of the strong things about this, uh, this place and then you see all these differences between the cultures, the, the shops, the things and the... And I, I was, but it's, I think for me it was a, it's a very company to, to buy something it's, it's, uh, because it's yeah the spice is each uh, quantity of things but everything looks like uh, from another time you know, the age, you know, the yeah she I mean the owner after explains because they bought everything in the 60s and 70s so they actually have real good clothes but from decades ago so it's a good place to buy in fact after I interviewed lots of uh, cinema and uh, costume Costume designers. Uh, costume designers and they all go there to buy things for um, uh, extras and for dying people they are shot so that they can it's cheaper to buy and for background so it's quite interesting <coughs> so before they had the clothing not clothing but textile section underneath the floor and uh, a lot of set designers went because it was so much cheaper to buy stuff so it really was a place you know where lots of and now lots of nuns go by underwears. Later on in the documentary, we have this series of nuns just buying bras. And so it's the mix of uh, costume designers from cinema and nuns. Yeah. That's, that's the and there's also the trans and, and all the and just normal people just meet there. It's cool that you just go there to have a stroll. So it's like part of the city. Yeah. But it, but in a way, even when you're doing the Twilight Zone part of it, you are showing. I mean, you are doing uh, an, a documentary because you are showing us what this looks like through, through a different perspective, through a different lens, I would say, the one of fictionalizing it. But the beginning is this true, we are fooled. It is an extremely straightforward documentary because we are seeing different locations and we are thinking just like a roulette game, you know, we see in different parts of the square, and then which one is going to be the one we focus on? This place, Mass. And then we start with the period pictures and uh, the voiceover, and we think we are in the most uh, classic, uh, straightforward uh, TV documentary. We're going to see all newsreel footage soon of the grand opening or Gina Luigi walking to this place or Sofia Loren. And then instead we see these contemporary actors walking in color and then switching to black and white. So once again fooling the audience somehow. Are you having fun fooling the audience? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, I mean for me it's, uh, it's uh, just get so bored when I see very straightforward things and you know I just need uh, relief. So it's really what I would like to see or at least to be surprised. Not with really a very normal, and then I really fought with my. In this case, it was strange because I had a production behind there was more cinema people, so I actually had to argue a lot because they they found it, they were very worried that it was too strange, you know. So 
by the end, I started at the, the beginning, I added it as the very last thing, because we had so many discussions. I said, okay, I'm going to give you two minutes. And, but then it was good, because otherwise you wouldn't know what it is. And I think to go strange, you really need to set the base of the history, and it's very nice to use their cover photographs as well. But really it was literally because also I wanted to give at least the sort of belief that something normal was going to happen and then you just go wherever I wanted to go. But there was fear in the air, in the production. Yeah. But I know, I know uh, you told me that uh, the reason why Yaya, the, the actress that plays the daughter of the owner, is on the screen is because the, ori the original person didn't want her face to be shown, yes. even though I assume that is the one that is on the picture before yes. before Yaya starts speaking or faking speaking. But would you have used the original, and she allowed to use her image? Well, the, the the reason why I was telling you before that I have these interviews later on with the costume designers is that I realized I really don't like interviewing people and then having these just talking heads. You know that mm -hmm. kills me. So um, that's why I realized I'd never do a documentary again because it's like I can't just yeah. have people uh, actually telling stories, so it's not my thing. But uh, so I cut that a lot, and so probably I would have not been happy abusing her. And in the end, it was great that she didn't want to be filmed, and, and then she was much freer in talking because she didn't have to put a face. And she thought we wouldn't use just the voice, so she was much more free. She saw the final project? Well, the, the thing was really scary because their family is quite aggressive. It's a Napolitan, like, huge family and they're, they're quite scary. They kicked us out many times and uh, so they weren't very happy that we were there. And, uh, uh, at the time we were filming, there was a huge article on a uh, daily magazine called La Repubblica where they were a, a link to a Camorra family, which is probably also not in that case, but in general it's probably a bit true. And um, so they were really in a bad mood in general. Uh, so we didn't show anything until the public screening in, uh, in Cinema Farnese, which was in Rome. And so she came with lots of paillettes and you know, I was really happy with the family and we were terrified because she was going to be there seeing this and obviously she talks a lot during the, the whole thing yeah. and, and there is things that people laugh at because she's quite funny yeah. um, so you know you never know if she, she's going to feel she's going to yeah. be taking me on you know, yeah, and because uh, there was an actress playing her with her as well. yeah. Uh, and then by accident the actress was sat next to her on the first row. Okay. So we were really, really scared at that point. Yeah. But she was a genius because when she saw herself talking and after she says lots of things about how Italy is going and everything, she would scream at herself saying, she's right, she's right, like she was someone else, like in third person. <laughs> so, I mean, and then, and then at the end she looked at Yaya Fort and said, you were quite good. <laughs> And then, now she, she's really happy she's put the poster of the documentary on the glass window for everything. So fiction and reality and they're married <laughs> yeah. together. That is, yeah. So you go to a, a mass to see a, you think you go to see a... But also, we were thinking since we... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were thinking that since we don't have a distribution, maybe we should make a 50 cent DVD <laughs> to be selling glass. Just that we would sell so many <laughs> at the exit. I also want to do a multiple with the, yeah, yeah. the Andes. Yeah. <laughs> I think that would be nice. Yeah. Great. And, uh, but going back to the idea of a remake, I know that uh, you're, you're talking now, you're considering a possible remake in a different style, uh, sort of a, of a fictional remake. Is that correct? Yes, I've um, had an idea recently of making a sort of feature film, but there is half a remake of a film called The, the Swimmer, which is a, a 1968 uh, American movie with Barn Lancaster, uh, which is a sort of bad movie, um, but from a really brilliant novel by John Cheever, so it's a short story that is brilliant, that is this man. Uh, who's in costume, like swimming costume the entire film and just swims, he says that he's going to swim home through the swimming pools of the villas of his friends all the way home as if it was a river. But then it's really like about the decline of the American dream and there's a whole metaphoric thing behind it. But his personal decline, I remember. Right? As well, yeah, he's actually gone mad and then yeah. he realized... So it's a breakdown. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, so I'm thinking to do a remake of that uh, screenplay, but in, uh, in Morocco, because in Morocco there's lots of, uh, as if in other countries, but uh, of villas made by rich people from other countries. They make their own new house with a swimming pool. Uh, so find real places, real houses of uh, real super rich, and actually ask them to almost play with us if they want. Uh, and then the actor is going to reenact the scenes in the, in the pools. But then, uh, instead of running from one villa to the other, as if in the film, you know, it just runs from one to the other, he's going to actually run through the streets of the Medina, which is very odd because we're in a swimming costume in, a, in Morocco. Uh, and that's going to be shot as a documentary. So it's just like the actual actor, uh, you know, asking to improvise and see what happens and have a really light crew. So just a cameraman and see what's going to happen. It's historically the one where uh, cinema was at its most unrealistic. You know, everything is uh, deeply staged and uh, you are very far away. I mean, with, you know, especially the Hollywood cinema and uh, in a way also Twilight Zone. Is, you know, that kind of TV was, was completely far away from from reality, and uh, and in a bit is is it's like science fiction, as in something that is for sure not real. So it is the most unrealistic of fictions. Sorry to keep stressing on that. <laughs> no, no, but I realized that when I was preparing clips, I got the Night of the Hunter, which is like a yeah. completely stylized, and uh, I definitely don't have a thing for realistic. Yeah. Taste, especially in yeah. cinema. And this also uh, is sort of, I, I don't know what you want to show. If you at the end of, of your work. Oh. oh no, I don't have... Um, you don't have yeah. anything else to show? No, no. I have, but I don't have, <laughs> I have few. <laughs> because I was thinking that another, another genre of that uh, is uh, absolutely ultra-fictional, is the war film. And uh, there is this project that is quite fascinating that you did, where you went to the, not just the war on fiction, but the fiction of war. And uh, it's this project that you did in Bolzano, for which we also actually have uh, something printed on paper. Amazingly enough, they still print it on paper. <laughs> and uh, it's right here if you want to see it later. And uh, it's. Uh, um, would you mind explaining us a little bit about it, or where, where, where did this start, uh, this idea of the fake tank and the real tank? Uh, this was a, a sort of long project that started in Bolsano a year ago for, for uh, a solo show there. Um, and then it, there were two or three things that triggered it. One was uh, the fact that in Bolsano there is a big uh, tank factory, which I didn't know and it was really odd to realize because it's such a small city. And then the, the factory is an Iveco, quite big and very important, that sells uh, in lots of countries. So it, it's kind of odd um, to discover. And, uh, and then I found these archival photographs of the First and Second World War uh, of fake tanks, that they're called uh, dummy tanks which really look like wooden structures and, uh, and they remind me a lot of uh, the ruins of Star Wars that I, and uh, the ones of film sets that I've been working on before because they really look like theatre props. Um, so I found that very interesting because basically they were doing lots of fake tanks to pretend they had more uh, a big army. Um, but then because the, the way of, uh, of seeing from far away at the time was quite basic so they didn't have uh, satellites, so, you know, you just needed a sort of wooden structure with a canvas painted on it. And it's the opposite of the camouflage. Exactly, it's like really... Well, it's like you disappear. You appear, exactly. But then what it strikes me is that it was so fake that really, like, you couldn't put more efforts. Like, if, especially the First World War, which is the, the first image that I actually recreated in the video, which we're going to see. Uh, it looks like a giant toy, and you just can't believe it, because uh, it's just so fake, even from far away, 
um, think is true. And uh, that's actually an image of a group of civilians in France at the end of the First World War. They just find this big toy left by the Germans probably running away, and they just wonder what it is. This is so strange and so fake and was left in the center of the city. So I found that very interesting and uh, very interesting for me to move on after my rooms of film sets. And then in the end it became quite a big project because it was a, a, a video which was made of two parts in one. Um, I, we organized a time to arrive in Bolzano unannounced. I mean the mayor knew but we managed to get it. Uh, arriving without police or without signs that was actually arriving, just to see and film hidden uh, the reactions of people. So in a way it was like, the idea was like, let's put a real tank, a contemporary real tank in a non-war situation, so a fake situation, and just see what happens. And on the other was, uh, you know, looking and so remaking uh, these archival photographs and footage of a, of a real war situation, uh, of people finding that very fake so that was done. And this yes. is called the authentic news of invisible things. Yes, which was <laughs> which was a, is a quote from a, a poem by Wordsworth. Mm -hmm. uh, although he uses the words tidings as opposed to news, but it's a very old yeah. word. And news of, for me also relates more to news. So because you're using an uh, actual news reel footage from the Imperial War Museum, right? Yes. Yeah. So I'll just show you.
this thing about the about the the time that actually they were making the tanks, it was the first World War, and the, actually the cinema was also coming at the same time. And then uh, the people were afraid when there was a train coming, no? Because they thought it was real. But in the first World War, they were actually not afraid of the automatic guns. And so for many years, a lot of people were dying because they didn't have the suits that, that was real. And they were thinking about this kind of fictional thing about the war that was still a kind of uh, 19th century way to make a fight. And uh, basically for a few years there was this, this, this completely misunderstanding of reality and fiction. I think it's, it's very nice this thing that you put together with this old... Uh, uh, and we're getting uh, back there. We're getting there again. Yeah. Because it's coming right now. It's the most... Uh, it, it, it is the biggest topic ever. What is actually happening now? We believe the news, we believe what we see, we believe what we read. But right now, I think we have reached the, the, I mean, the more, let's say, the society, first of all, society has, has, has relied on images and uh, media, uh, the more we are far away from uh, trying to grasp something and say, this is the truth. This is real. So in a way, we are. I, I talk from the, 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 my perspective of uh, a man that works in the audiovisual. I think we are right now in, in medieval times. People do believe in whatever yeah, they want the way, to believe and they want to. It's the way also the, the people believe more in images than in text mm -hmm. or in text and uh, like like now that is the first idea of. A, no, a train coming to the to the audience, no? Yes. And now also if you see, you know, these images of these uh, drones that are destroying something, no? We believe that it's true, but it could be completely fictional. Exactly. Because it's, uh, you, know. you never know what is real. We believe, we still yeah. believe in the image. Even in this naive way, how uh, one century ago they were believing in the train coming to get the audience. Yeah, we still believe the, that the image of the small camera... Yeah, and but I'm not talking about news, uh, just you know, by chance, because there is an artist that is called Radio Martino that has made a, <laughs> that has made a, a work that puts together uh, fiction and images and actual news, which could also be titled The Authentic News of Invisible Things. And uh, it is a, a staging of uh, uh, news that for, for a month, I think, what is it? August 2006? Oh, yes. Yeah, is that the thing? When we also, you know, we also wonder about the world of media where we live in and uh, what is our perception of what we are told. As a matter of fact, this is uh, uh, you know, a very uh, hot topic in this age of multi, uh, 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 multi source. You know, multiple sources of information, but in the end, you have no singular truth, but you believe who you want to be. So, what are the news? The news are what I want. The news to be. So, yeah, we are in the room full of mirrors. Yeah. So, it was a hint. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a, a work that is actually two actors by see, singing the news, which was actually the original title. Uh, now the title is um, August 2008, because it was the news of that month of, uh, of August. Uh, but all the news are treated in the same way, so the very stupid ones, the very tragic ones, and they just became the lines of the song.
Eleven people are now known to have been killed in a bomb explosion in Tripoli. Foreign ministers from the European Union are holding an emergency meeting in Brussels. On the crisis in Georgia, 200 Palestinian prisoners have been released by Israel to what it calls a gesture of goodwill. Zimbabwe ruling party and opposition have been unable to reach a power sharing deal. Lorenzo, this might 
actually be the end of our year of artist talks because it's, it's quite a the, moment. Get open to the, if, to the exactly, maybe to the audience. <coughs> Maybe. Yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. The artist said, okay, I talk to you. No, I was just saying, I don't have a perspective. I have a suggestion. I made that suggestion for the closing. They say they want to see it to me. Peace. To me, it's like that. They want to be in court. Ma sono sorry perché non vuoi. Perché sta conducendo. Ah, ok. Ciao, Odius. Hi. Allora. Do you want two more minutes of Gadi Martin? Yes. By public demand. It's meant to go in a loop, it doesn't mean that. Shuffle the, uh, the the image, and you do both. 
in, in two minutes, so, and multiple times. <laughs> So the thing of suspension, so it's something more like the suspense, the suspension, what's happening now, so basically you show this kind of technical elements inside something that's typical, some kind of movie structure, psychological structure to suspense something, so where you don't know something and slowly it's going to show up, but it's really the suspense of the thing. But you, you're waiting to see what's going to happen next, to so there is it's a sort of a, of a lynch situation where you, you, you're wondering what, what, what is going on and why we see these two faces while they're inquiring with us because well, the audience is taken. Uh, but it's the, the, the first you moment you see this goes up of the two faces and of course one is reversed so this, you know, she's suspended so she's always, you see that there's some, something and, and then you saw the reason of these two moments that one there's something strange about this, this, this girl because it's upside down, basically, but you don't know it, so it's kind of emerged in something. And the other one, which is actually holding, so it's kind of energy, stress, and, and this is this feeling slowly when they done this, it's up. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, first, because when you do close ups like this in cinema, obviously, you think there is uh, almost a relationship between, between them, so it could be almost a romantic thing, you know. Uh, but then, of course, when you see the whole thing, you realize they're just looking at the camera, so that's yeah. uh, given away. Yeah. Yes, yeah, because the axis is uh, perfectly in front, so, yeah. so yeah. You, don't, you don't perceive it as dialogue. Yeah. Also, it's freedom with the camera, you know, the, the camera can be upside down. That is it, that they can swapple something with the opposite, with this uh, uh, subjective element of the camera, that then it can be places. No, no, because technically speaking, if you speak to think about subjective, is when the camera takes the point of view point of point. the character. Yeah. No, but uh, it's a uh, kind of subjective because this takes the, the point of view. The ultimate not objective is it's not looking, it's not she looking, but it's looking how she's looking. So it's, it's a kind of mirroring uh, subjective. Because <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it what it what Gazetti called interpellation. Eh? Yeah. It is the Definitely. fourth element of. Uh, of emoji, yeah? yeah, subjective, objective, subjective. unreal, objective, and... Uh, but because basically the camera is, the is put on the same, uh, it's upside down like she is. So you don't know it that she's upside down because it's, it's, it's put on the same... One, one, one more... <laughs> <laughs> no, the camera not upside down. Yeah. No, she was upside down. She's upside down. And I moved, oh yeah, well... Right now the camera is upside down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And she's also but it's, it's like the camera is yeah, yeah, okay. The camera is not moves. And then the end, what is it? Sorry. So it's just the show. It's the one the critics take over. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> the theorician, the theoreticians uh, start to arise. Uh, it's the end of theorization. It's the end of the year. So, audience, do you have any questions or suggestions? or? Um, no, you, if you're all camera shy and you don't want to be put upside down by that. Uh, well, what can I say? Thank you, uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to finish the year with Ra. Yeah, with Ra. Yeah, and yeah. we can say that we are going to start the year with... With directions tomorrow. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 that's right. <laughs> we start uh, the year... Tomorrow with, is uh, something else. We start the year next year with Dominica Marino. In February, February 2015. Hopefully, hopefully. But in the meantime, if you're still uh -huh. grasping for more video art, for more Ra and for more Lorenzo, tomorrow is Directions at the Macacon, tomorrow and also Saturday at 8.30, tomorrow and also 8.30. Right? 8.30? Yes. Yes. Tomorrow and Saturday we wait for you at the Macacon. In the meantime, feel free to enjoy a drink here. Thank you again, Rita, for hosting us. And feel free to reach out to us if you haven't heard of it.